for the participants. We are starting with the presentations right now. So I take this opportunity once again to welcome you all to this national conference. So the first participants for the day is Ms. Sahaya Shanti Risha from JP College of Arts and Science. And sir, your audio is very slow, sir. It's very low, sir. Am I audible now? Yeah, but I it's very really feeble. It's very feeble. You're audible, but it's very feeble. Uh, then it is not a problem. I'll just uh, initiate this. Uh, uh, yeah, now it's session. fine, sir. Uh, okay, um, uh, good morning once again. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, presenting on behalf of uh, Mr. Damindra sir, since this, audible, uh, sorry, this audio is very uh, feeble. So uh, we will now resume with our uh, paper presentation, starting with Ms. Sahaya Shanti uh, Nisha. Uh, Ma'am, please uh, proceed. And for uh, participants and students, uh, please reserve all your questions at the end of the present presentation. You can post it uh, in the uh, chat box. So uh, after five minutes, uh, we can go for a quick discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, over to uh, Ms. Sahaya Shanti Nisha. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. And good morning to you all. Uh, sir, shall I share my screen? Yeah, ma'am, please, ma'am. Oh. I hope that uh, my screen is visible. Okay, so good morning to all and my uh, and uh, sahai shantanisha i'm from uh, jp college of arts and science and my topic uh, i have taken the topic today is social revamping and amelioration of english language so as the language all the language are in progress english language is also in progress we are changing a lot the english language is changing a lot and our english language is also changing in connection with the technology as the technology is improving and it is developing a lot, we, our language, English language is also developing with the connection with technology. And the language change is starting from the adults as well as the youngsters, in my point of view. So, and the, the adults as well as the youngsters are taking the new words to the old people. And the old people and the um, uh, children, they are hoping that these are the trending words and they are using it in the day-to-day -day life. So the first change is, change is starting from the adults as well as the youngsters. And the fact that language always changes, it doesn't mean that it's getting worse, but it is becoming different. Our English language is going to be different. And so the, uh, the English language is changing in different perspectives and the fa there are certain factors for the changes. Namely, the first one is the political factor. The political factor, we can take that. I'm um, sorry, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt, ma'am. Uh, are you presenting your screen, ma'am? Yes, sir. Is it visible? Uh, it's not visible, ma'am. How about others? Can uh, anybody see ma'am's uh, screen? Uh, sorry, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay, okay. Wait a minute. Is it visible, sir? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So the changing factors, the language is changing due to the due to some factors. The first one is the political factor. Because of the immigration and uh, colonization, invasion, due to these factors, the language is changing a lot. So all the, due to the uh, political factor means the uh, different countries country people are mingling in one place, place and due to that, the language is also uh, changing a lot. And the next factor is the social factor. So uh, we know that each profession use a certain uh, set of words. We use the set of words. So if the professionals mingle in one place in a society, the language also, the words they are using also get inside. So every language is getting changed. And then the cultural factor. So the uh, different cultural people are living in our India. So due to that, the, uh, the people 
different culture mingle with each other and so that the language also getting changed next one is the technological factor in this scenario we all know that the technology is improving a lot and the technology is moving towards the peak which we haven't predicted so we now we are in the virtual meet we before 5 years we couldn't imagine even before 2019 we couldn't imagine that we can meet in this way so we are having many platforms in many google uh, classroom and google meet zoom everything we are using in in our day to day life so the technology is developing so that the language is also evolve evolve evolution in the process of evolution and the next factor is the environmental one so in the uh, current scenario there are new diseases are getting inside and the new words are arising in our uh, country as well as in the world so in this 2020 we are very much familiarized with the new words like pandemic new normal covid and vaccine social distancing so in this 2020 these words are getting familiarized in our environment so these are the factors for the uh, changing of the language and the english language is revamping in different processes like borrowing new words from the other language as well as Uh, we are coining new words we are abbreviating and we are also combining two words we are blending two words and creating new words so here first uh, first i'm going to talk about the borrowed words uh, we are using in our data that many english words we are thinking that they are english words but many of the words are borrowed from the other language so here mac home in his book understanding language change has given some of the examples uh, the hammock hurricane maize tobacco these are the words which we are using in our day to day life but these are the words taken from borrowed from language and the next word bungalow bungalow jungle pajama shampoo and these are the words which are borrowed from the language of hindi then coffee coffee is that it in our day to day life we use the word coffee so these this is the word taken from turkish and some of the words like chabu chachu these are the words taken from polynesian and then bamboo ketchup these are the words which are borrowed from malay and then paradise lilac bazaar caravan chess shawl khaki these are the normal words which we use in our day to day life so these are the words which are borrowed from the persian so these are not english words these are these are the persian words and in, uh, in our everyday life we are using some abbreviations also even uh, the abbreviations are not uh, used in our formal emails also so in uh, in the in the previous days which uh, when we are uh, using the mobile phones when we are starting using the mobile phones we will be having the abbreviations but in our day to day life we are using the for in using these abbreviations in the emails also uh, some of the abbreviations are lol lol means laugh out loud and yolo means you only live once then a uh, pfa please find the attachment these are the, this is a common abbreviation which we are using in the mails then uh, bay means baby and then bff best friends forever imo imo means in my opinion then byw it is by the way and then oic oic is uh, oic that's the uh, abbreviation of this and so uh, next there are some other uh, abbreviations are there it is used in our day to day life and then coining new words in this present scenario there are many new words and added in the oxford dictionary also so the main words are some some of the words i have mentioned here awk awk means during the pandemic we are in the lockdown so in the lockdown scenario we can't consider for who so when we are taking a walk outside and making an if uh, Afford to look at the things which are around us. When we are looking around that around us, that is the all. And then contact. This means not having any interaction with others. In this lockdown, we can't have any contact with others. We can't talk with each other. We can't talk with the neighbors. And the next uh, word is doom scrolling. That is mean. That means the reading the news on social media during this pandemic inside the home. And we are looking only at the mobile phones for the updates. and for the tv uh, tv news we are reading the news so in the social media there are many updates about the covid and the spreading of the covid so we will read the updates and we will be getting scared 
So these are this is doom scrolling. Then PPE. PPE means personal protective equipment. In this situation, we we are all have the personal protective equipment like thermometer as well as the pulse oximeter with us. Then quarantine means a teenager during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the next one is WFH. So this is a normal word which we are very much familiar in this pandemic. That is work from home. So it is added in the Merriam Webster during the last April month. Work from home. And then next one is the blended world. Uh, blend in this uh, scenario, most of us are having the brunch in our home. We won't be uh, getting uh, soon, and we'll be having the breakfast as well as lunch in the same time itself. So that is brunch. And the next word is carjack. That means car hijack. Then chillax, chill plus relax. Then chocoholic, a person who is addicted to chocolate. That is the chocoholic. Then Bollywood, Bombay plus Hollywood. And then spoke. Spoke is a word which is uh, unfamiliar for me. So it is. We can use it as spoon as well as spoke. So spoke. And Spanglish. These are the the Spanglish, Hanglish, Spanglish. These are the words which we use usually use in our normal day day. So Spanish plus English. Then skirt means skirt plus shorts. So it is it, uh, maybe uh, said as the divided skirt in the previous days. Now it is skirt. That is it will be looking like a skirt, but it will be a short. And then netizen. We are the we are almost the netizens. We are the internet citizens. So uh, the netizen is another word. Here are the uh, words which are blended words. So I'm going to conclude my uh, presentation. So here. the language is changing a lot due to the technology so the technology uh, the language change is not degrading the english language but it is diversifying the english english language and uh, as david crystal mentions in an interview the language has become excessively richer as a result of internet so because of the internet our english language is getting very much richer it is reaching nook and corner of the world and it is enriching itself people are almost coming uh, aware that without english we can't do anything that's that's uh, that's a point in our all in all uh, in all of us so uh, if not the technology is present over there the language will change it will continue to change probably at a slower level so the uh, language due to the internet due to the technology the uh, language is evolving uh, the uh, the process of evolution is going on there and not in the uh, it's not degrading the english language so that's all and uh, i'd like to thank all you for uh, for your patient listening thank you sir thank you so much for that presentation ma'am the forum is now open for uh, questions if you have any questions please do ask uh, ma'am any question good morning the organizers am i audible is my screen visible yeah kamala devi ma'am yes ma'am uh, can you just wait for 2 minutes ma'am for your presentation let me just confirm okay, sir, your any... voice is very feeble for me ah uh, okay ma'am fine ma'am ah uh, yeah ma'am it is visible ma'am thank you okay prithvi sir am i audible now ah uh, yes, yes 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 kamala devi ma'am just give us uh, Two minutes time. Let me find yes, out if there are any questions, sir. and then we'll proceed, ma'am. Uh, yes, the forum is now open. If there are any questions, feel free to ask. If not, we'll proceed to the next presentation. Okay, thank you. So we will now proceed to the next presentation. So we have uh, Ms. Kamla Devi. From Sri Sarada College of Education, presenting. Ma'am, the stage is yours. Thank you, sir. Shall I present now? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, all of you. I am Kamala Devi, working as an assistant professor of English at in Sri Sarada College of Education, Salem. Going to present the paper, changing role of professional education teachers. on the basis of the need analysis of students the classrooms of the professional programs have been changed with novel students with their own profiles emerging with their own specific needs and ambitions these digital native students 
or highly focused goal driven and require functional knowledge concentrating on acquisition of skills dialogue based learning which is significantly challenging the teacher's traditional lecturer role not only is the student profile changing but so is their way of learning also we have to build comfort with technological tools such as anti plagiarism software use of whiteboard like solutions and delivering the materials via learning management systems etc so they have become the part and parcel of the new education scenario what are the expectations of this millennials of india during the 20th century students learnt english as the second language they are varied in their own abilities and interest and in most cases english was taught as one of the subjects with the domination of the regional languages in english classes and they focused more on reading and writing skills but nowadays even in the 21st century the challenges from the previous century continued and at the same time a new learner has also emerged with the following expectations for them the learning should be an experience and not just knowing and they want to work and learn in groups collaboratively and they need immediate communication with the teachers and getting feedback for their performance as early as possible and they are really worried about these kind of routine methods of learning so they they want to change they want to continue they don't want to continue the same routine methods of learning coming over to the need for the study and significance of the study irrespective of the social cultural political and personal inequalities the system of indian education can be propelled to progress from its present aimlessness and inflexibility with the help of one factor who is that that is the teacher the kothari commission 1966 also said of all the different factors which influence the quality of education and its contribution to national development the quality the competence and the character of teachers are undoubtedly the most significant even the reason national education policy too exhorts that teachers truly shape the future of our children and therefore the future of our nation so thereby implying that teachers play the most important role in nation building by creating high quality of human resource in their classrooms we followed the normative survey method for the present study and the sampling technique that we used is stratified random sampling techniques the totally 1000 students from engineering and teacher education institutions were selected uh, this is the detail of the students from engineering institutions and this is the detail of the students from teacher education so they were classified based on the strata of their type of institution whether they are from college or university and management of institution government government aided and self financing and then locality the research is constructed following tool for data collection the name of the tool is perceptions of professional education students on their needs and priorities of learning english the tool has two sections one is introductory section in which their personal and academic details of the respondent were collected and the next section is needs of english language learning in which there are 36 statements related to their uh, needs those 36 statements were divided into five dimensions and the first dimension is related to the oral oral skills related needs in which there are 13 items and in this table all the 13 items were uh, ordered in the descending order prioritizing their needs first and this is the role the changing role needed for the teacher based on the first dimension that the teachers of english are expected to focus more on improving the students listening and speaking skills because the students consider this oral communication skills as their primary need fluency and following other phonetic aspects like speaking with proper stress and voice modulation are felt more important by the students which implies that the teachers should concentrate more on teaching them 
and obviously the best way to teach oral oral skills is to model it so the teachers of english need not rely on delivering the lectures and dealing with the syllabi alone instead they may play some academic related audios and videos either by the native speakers or by other eminent personalities and that by the teachers can create an english ambience it's not only transformation of information and comprehension but training of listening and speaking for which continuous and planned instructional design must be prepared by the teachers they may use the real life oriented resources like radio and television uh, most probably english channel and ict tools like podcasts sending audio files through lms and youtube videos for language improvement of the students teachers should make it compulsory to have english atmosphere at least in the english classroom moving on to the second dimension which uh, collected their needs related to reading and writing skills the conclusion shows that the primary need of students related to this reading and writing skills is to write without spelling mistakes when it comes to higher education the teachers overlook the importance of teaching spelling moreover due to the advancement of artificial intelligence the spelling errors can be found out and corrected on the screen itself but still it is expected to introduce new words along with their spelling as far as reading is considered students prefer to read extensively like reading related reference materials research articles and newspapers hence the teachers of english are expected to extend the selection of reading materials adding the recent research studies and other materials along with the prescribed texts the students responses throw light on the need of using online written communication which implies that the teachers have to teach the functional writing skill of the students for common and professional communication the etiquette of online writing like writing emails or uh, writing in the social network sites needs to be added in the instru instruction itself the third dimension of the tool deals with their academic related needs and that shows that the digital age students are fed up with repeating what they read instead they want to compose on their own so the scope to express their understanding in their own language should be created by the teachers assessment strategies should consider the oral examination more than paper pencil test which will also be more reliable to test the authentic comprehension skill of the students the lowest score for the statement the testing and assessment schemes of the present day meet the needs of the students implies that the teachers have to utilize continuous and comprehensive evaluation strategies giving consideration to the development of all four communication skills equally the fourth dimension is uh, employment related needs for which the students prioritized uh, their need to write resumes and job applications so the teachers duty does not end with the curriculum transaction but extends to boost up the employability skills of the students too the language teachers should also train the students to develop their soft skills too they should guide them on preparation of good resume interview skills and how to face the com competitive exams for which they have to also the teachers have to also sail with the tide and keep updated with the recent trends of business communication apart from subject related explanation the teachers have to give them exposure on functional situations like introducing oneself or negotiating with others without hurting their sentiments and like all these things because these things will elevate the students disposition both in interview and also during the employment period the final dimension tests their uh, social related needs in which uh, the teachers have to shift the focus from writing skill alone to all the other skills like listening speaking and reading so equal concentration to all the four skills is needed for uh, the students to have a good command over english language so a comprehensive approach is expected from the teachers so to conclude the research findings pointed out that the students expectations with regard to their teachers as follows number 1 increased concentration to the fluent and effective communication skills rather than reading and writing 
encouraging the students written compositional skill uh, developing their employability skills by honing up the soft skills considerably uh, effective integration of online and ict tools while teaching building up confidence of speaking in english by creating a nurturing english ambience with this i thank everyone for your patient listening and giving me giving me this golden opportunity to present our research findings in this national platform thank you everyone thank you so much ma'am for that presentation now the forum is open for questions feel free to ask questions Uh, ma'am, uh, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Am I? Hey, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you so much for the detailed uh, uh, presentation, ma'am. Um, uh, you uh, concentrated more on how uh, new learners have actually evolved and how um, uh, the, the the teaching strategy should also evolve alongside uh, with the new learners and how to compete uh, uh, as teachers alongside uh, in order to uh, match the. Uh, 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 the needs of the uh, new learner so you are being uh, concentrating on one important term called uh, uh, experiential learning right so can you just yes, list sir. out any few uh, uh, experiential learning uh, right now in this online mode like because like uh, we do not have physical classes to engage the students more um, can you just oh. give us few tips on the experiential learning how we can uh, basically take students uh, uh, to take uh, active part students taking active part in the online mode of course sir as you have correctly pointed out that experiential learning is very very important because only through meaningful experiences the students will have this uh, the fullest sense of ex learning so in this online mode we in our college we are maintaining this learning management system which is called edmodo in which we are able to send all the materials okay so what we do now instead of sending only the text materials we used to record our own audio files in which i will explain everything uh, so through by i am able to read uh, when the students are listening to my audio file with their eyes closed they said to me that ma'am as if we are sitting in the english classroom we are able to listen to the class and the second one i used to go for uh, i uh, improvisation of the resources in my home and taking it as a very short videos and send it to the students and thereby we will assign some projects like how will you introduce this particular because as we are from teacher education we will give some situations to the future teachers that is the prospective teachers student teachers and then how will you explain it you can also improvise your own tools from your home so thereby when they are going to take the concepts like a a uh, definition of noun or parts of speech they try to explain those eight parts by using the materials which are available in their own home uh, and even this google meet is also highly helpful for us in which i will be having a little kid of my own uh, before my screen and then these students from their end point they have to teach the kid using those improvised materials so in that way they experience what they have learned when i teach them inductive method of teaching grammar deductive method of teaching grammar and a direct method grammar translation method they are able to experience it when it comes to the assignment like how will you teach following this methodology they taught it and it is also very nice they are able to improvise a lot of materials with the available resources at their own homes so like this it is up to the teachers we have to find out the solutions sir Did fine, I answer fine, your question? Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, ma'am, um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, like, uh, I want also uh, interact with uh, Sahaya Shanti, ma'am. Sha, ma'am, who also uh, made the first uh, made a first presentation. I think, uh, uh, ma'am, will not mind if, in case, I ask this question to ma'am. Ma'am, are you there, ma'am? Shanti Nisha, ma'am, are you there, ma'am? Yes, sir. Okay, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Soon after your presentation, I was not able to unmute. Uh, I don't think yes, you sir. would mind uh, me asking you a, 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 a few clarifications with your presentation, ma'am. Yes, sir. 
Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. So you were uh, concentrated more on uh, the changing factors. How uh, abbrevi abbreviations play a very vital role. How uh, um, uh, we have started using blended words, finding new words, and um, how we actually uh, enrich uh, 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 these words, right, ma'am. So do you think yes, that, uh, this current technology made the students uh, very lazy, ma'am? Say, for example, uh, we have the um, uh, auto dictionary as such. Like, if in case we wanted to just type a word called association. or maybe words like conglomeration uh, words uh, i mean uh, uh, words which have more than uh, 10 or 15 alphabets in it right so it it right. do you think that uh, the technology makes a students uh, uh, lazy ma'am with regards to your uh, presentation so what is your uh, uh, your point on it ma'am so uh, we can take it in a different point of view sir if uh, they are they are using more abbreviations so it's not take, making them too lazy but they are creating a lot in their minds and they are uh, in this fast moving world they are um, very much fast with the technology so they are abbreviating a lot and also creating a lot they are um, they are uh, moving uh, in this scenario they are uh, moving um, um, trending is very much fast i think Uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am i do understand uh, the, the the students also move very fast alongside with the technology so my my yes. point over here ma'am is 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 it making the students little lazy ma'am because like uh, if in case we write letters or if in case we write any answers even we can feel that impact that uh, the technological impact on the answer scripts as well say for example uh, um, shutting down or shedding out all those vowels in it uh, if, say for example when we just message saying good morning We, there is no g o o d it's just only g d and uh, m r n g so they are just yeah. shutting out all those uh, vowels out in it so it also uh, uh, makes a habit for the students to use the same effect in their answer scripts right yeah. so uh, that, that is what i'm just trying to uh, ask ma'am do you think that really technology uh, makes the students little lazy <laughs> we can also in it in one point of view also sir because we, it is very much visible in our uh, answers sheets when, when you are valuing we can see the uh, short uh, abbreviations there yes ma'am yes ma'am <laughs> yes, okay ma'am thank you so much okay. thank you thank you sir wonderful thank presentation you. yes so dharam sir uh, we can move on to the next presentation thank sure you. sir thank you next we have uh, mr guhan priyadarshan research scholar iit kharagpur so this stage is yours sir Uh, yeah. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, moderators, uh, participants, and the audience. Uh, I'm Gohan Pradarshan, research scholar at IIT Kharagpur. Uh, the topic of my paper is uh, the English language in emergent India: post-colonial futures and the question of standardization. Uh, please uh, uh, make sure I'm audible because I have been facing incessant, uh, you know, uh, network connectivity issues since morning due to rain. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So this is the title of my paper. Uh, can you show me the second slide? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, this paper is actually divided into two parts. The first one is I have talked about the historical uh, genealogy of English language and standardization. And I'm sorry, there is a spelling mistake in the first point. It's supposed to be London, uh, but you know <laughs> there is an error. So I'm sorry for that. So you know if you look at English language in general, what you call as the English language was at one point of time synonymous with what we call as the British English. and this british english also has a, if you look at the history of the terminology uh, the very term british english was actually employed in united states to distinguish their variety of english language from that of the british uh, if it was purely a political reason first of all so before i get into that part i want to talk about how english language i mean the east midland uh, london dialect became a standard british english the standard style uh, the standard language or the standard tongue in in great britain uh, it is it is not just you know linguistic factor but various political factors were also in play uh, for example this was uh, you know until until 14th century the french language was actually the primary language of administration and law enforcement in great britain uh, in great britain 
and it was Latin, which was actually the language of the church. And what actually happened during the 14th century was that there was an Anglo-French war, which is commonly called as a Hundred Year War, which kind of you know instigated nationalisms in both the in both the parties, like among the British and among the among the French, which kind of uh, made anti-French sentiments rampant across England, which you know which kind of showed away uh, French language. Uh, from the administrative and uh, legal frameworks in Great Britain at that point of time. And it was at the same time, you actually have two great universities, Oxford and Cambridge, in, in this part, in the southern part of uh, England, where the East Midland dialect is actually spoken. And it was also at the same time, London, a bustling city, was actually reaping its economic, uh, economic prosperity. It was the initial days of British colonialism. They are yet to send you know, the, the merchant ships to, Brit uh, to India and to the rest of the world. So this was the beginning of everything, what we know as history of India, of modern day India, or whatever you call it as. So it was in this scenario that East Midland dialect, which is primarily spoken in Southern England and in London, was actually institutionalized to make it as a national tongue in England. And also the birth of Protestant church in England, uh, it kind of coincides, it has a coincidence with this time period. And, you know, once again, the birth of Protestant church is also very, very political. So all these factors, all these social economic economic and political factors kind of led to uh, standardization of East Midland London dialect and it was transmuted into a national standard British English. On the other hand, as you know, the, the first settlers in America, the first British settlers in America were also, you know, they also moved into the United States for political reasons. They were persecuted in England for their religion. Most of them were Puritans. And at the beginning of the 17th century, the Puritans were actually persecuted in the Great Britain. So they had to leave the island and then they found their home in the United States, which was to be followed in the several other decades as well. So, you know, their migration to the United States was purely political. And also, you know, they wanted to create their own identity in their newfound land, for which the British was not letting them, which, you know, kind of led to the American War of Revolution. And after the establishment of United States of America, what we get to see is that English was not actually the predominant language in the land, because at some, in some parts, the French was actually the main language, in some parts, the Spanish was actually the main language and in some pockets German was also the main language. So there are two persons but at the, but at the same time you have to know that the politics, the I mean the the the, the, the predominance uh, in the in the political landscape of the United States of the time was predominantly with the British settlers from the Great Britain. So they were actually the political elite at the time. So we have two important figures, Samuel Adams and Daniel uh, Delaney, who wanted to kind of liberate English language also from the domination of the British. And um, this was truly, it's an ideal. It's an ideological type. Maybe I mean it's not it's not pro appropriate to use decolonization at this juncture, but it was an ideological departure from everything British because. At the same time, you know, they also renounce the British crown. So they also want to create a known identity for their English language. So it was then, you know, you have uh, Webster coming up. He actually kind of institutionalized what we call as the American general English, and it kind of diverse uh, political and linguistic diverse from the Great Britain. Uh, so actually what Webster actually said was this general American English uh, had incorporated, you know, various flavors of English spoken across American territories. But we get to know that, you know, it was, it was not 
as, uh, you know, it was not as liberal as Webster thought it to be, because a kind of critical analysis of the, of the trend of American English would convey that they have not included the English spoken by the African American immigrants or the slaves. So it's, it's not actually, you know, it's not actually all incorporating uh, as opposed to what it was claimed to be. So here we come to the definition of standardized uh, standardization. Standardization is nothing but codified in grammatical description dictionaries and uh, and manuals of usage. I mean, it's it's nothing but a codification of how a language has to be used. So we have got uh, two uh, two. Fa I mean, we have got two Englishes right now: the general American English and the standard British English, which are standardized. So you are supposed to use these languages, use these varieties based on the prescription, based on how it should be used. You have a general rule, be it to pronunciation or be it to uh, grammatical usage. You have to follow that, or you might be, you know, or or it would be. It would be seen as you are grammatically or, or technically wrong in employing that English language. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, and another important in, important factor is that you know, like the British Standard English is right now spoken by less than three percentage of the population of Great Britain. It's quite fascinating because they were unable to uh, take the standardization to their people as well. But we kind of stick to that elsewhere. You know, like for example, if you want to move to the Great Britain, you are supposed to uh, you know know the Standard British English, and same uh, with uh, with the United States as well. Now, here I have uh, four. You know, here I have four conditions. The first one is the loose sphere condition, and this is basically, you know, a, you know, interpretation of the contemporary lang linguistic uh, linguistic atmosphere based on the socio-political uh, conditions of various countries. For example, loose loose sphere is, uh, is is a term referring to the Portuguese speaking territories across the world. Uh, you know, Portugal being the primary one. You have other countries like Brazil, uh, Mozambique. In Africa and Angola in Africa as well. So uh, I mean, Portugal until until the beginning of the 21st century was actually having the full influence on Lusophone. So whatever the Portuguese language is is actually determined by the power center in Portugal. But what we but, but what happened in the in the 21st century was actually the 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 Brazil you know it kind of triumphed economically and politically right now and the geopolitical landscape what we see is that brazil plays a more significant role than portugal so brazil kind of eclipsed its ex-mother country portugal and this is very you know reflective in online uh, for example if you if you go to any dictionary portuguese dictionary the portuguese language is symbolically represented by Brazilian flag, and this is something quite interesting because the Portugal has de facto lost its control over the Portuguese language, which is its own language, and its ex colony Brazil has a huge influence over the Portuguese language. It's similar to the Hispanic condition as well. Uh, Spain being the mother country, it, it ruled vast territories of Latin America, excluding Portugal, uh, like some countries like Chile, uh, Peru, Argentina, Colombia, all these territories, and Mexico, uh, Panama, all these territories were ex-Spanish uh, colonies. And what we also see similar to the Lusophone condition is that Mexico being economical superpower, we also tend to see that, you know, like many uh, industrial establishments from the United States also moved to Mexico for the production. So there is a huge economic development uh, in Mexico, which kind of eclipsed that of Spain. So, so when it comes to Spanish language right now, it is Mexico which exerts more influence, uh, more influence than Spain or any other Spanish speaking territory. On the contrary, we have the French condition, the French, you know, the French right now even have so many colonies across the world, technically speaking. 
And, but France still kind of, you know, controls the authority over the French language. Um, one of, but, but demographically speaking, it's actually a democratic republic of Congo in, uh, in, in the Central Africa, which is the largest French-speaking country. And it also has the largest French-speaking city called Kinshasa, which is its capital. On the other hand, its socio-political significance is not that great because of its economy is very poor and it is, it is one of the... Uh, one of the industrialized countries in the world. Um, when it comes to Anglo-American condition, it's quite interesting because what we call as, you know, the and eclipsing that of UK. But culturally speaking, uh, the English right now has two epicenters, the standard British epicenter based in the United Kingdom and general American English based in the United States. So, so there, is, there, is this, there is this two epicenters, unlike the other conditions I have talked about when it comes to English language. Now, now this is very important because it is in this context I'm going to locate the future of English language in India because India is destined to become an economic superpower similar to China. China in the beginning of the 20th century, in the 21st century, was you know, very close to what India was at, at that point of time. But there was a great leap which India could not actually achieve. But India is destined to do what China has done. So we could say that, you know, but already you can see the signs. For example, India is the largest uh, economy is, is, has a, is a larger economy than its ex mother country, the United Kingdom, and it's right now the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, so, you know, by the end of the century, we could see that India would emerge much faster and it could even take on the USA. And it is at this point, at this hypothesis, I have actually situated my research question. Uh, in this case, you know, like since India being a British colony, ex colony of the Great Britain, there is also this question of decolonization, also linguistic decolonization, especially. So if India, you know, kind of eclipses the contemporary epicenters of English language, what would the future of English language be? This is my research question. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so to understand this, uh, yeah, so I have talked about uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the condition of English language in India until today. So, um, yeah, so for example, the Indian constitution, which came into effect in 1950, January 26, kind of mandates that English language should be replaced by Hindi as the official language uh, 15 years after its commencement in the uh, 1965, uh, this is what Article 3, uh, Article 343 of Indian Constitution states. Also, Article 351 implies that, you know, like, uh, government of India should uh, make sure that it promotes Hindi language. So there is a kind of, you know, there is a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, there is, I mean, the Indian, in the, the forefathers of Indian, uh, Indian nation, I mean, the founders of Indian nation, they have this kind of hatred towards English language, and they want to displace it altogether and replace it with Hindi. And it was also seen as a symbol of national uh, resurgence. But what we also see is that, you know, there was a strong uh, regional uh, resistance to imposition of Hindi as the official language uh, of the Indian state. So, for example, in Tamil Nadu, there was a widespread anti-Hindi agitations. And in 1963, the Indian parliament passed Official Languages Act uh, making English as the official language for the prolonged usage alongside Hindi. So uh, it is because of the regional uh, regional politics or the or the strong regional identity surrounding the linguistic identity, we uh, get to the situation in which English is continue to be used as one of the official languages in India. This is the first premise. Um, second second slide. Next slide, please. 
Yeah. Now, if you look at the contemporary uh, socio-political condition of India, so we also see a very strong regional identity. It is, you know, the regional identity which kind of came into existence in the beginning of the 1960s is still intact. For example, uh, actually this part I kind of messed up in my paper. So I talked about Karnataka flag and Canada flag being synonymous, but de facto it is not. Uh, so I have to you know rewrite that part in my paper. So for example, if you if you take Karnataka, the state of Karnataka in South India, uh, we kind of see the reiteration of the state identity and the linguistic identity through through Canada state flag, through Canada language flag and Karnataka state flag. In 2018, the then Congress government of Karnataka, it kind of, you know, like it wanted to have its own flag for the state. And it was actually not accepted by the by the other part by the parliament and by the other opposition parties in Karnataka. Nevertheless, Kannada language flag, which is also not constitutionally, uh, you know, which is also not constitutional, is 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 widespread among Karnataka. Like you could actually spot it everywhere, but the but it is constitutionally. Uh, not valid. So we kind of see this emergence of regional identity and the re regional identity is kind of intact. For example, one of the burning questions in Tamil Nadu is whether to call the central government as the union government. So this is once again, this also has the grounding in the reiteration of the regional identity. So we tend to see that regional identity supplementing the national identity. It's also important to note that in the beginning of 1960s, there was this anti-sedition law which was Passed, uh, which was, you know, uh, passed in the Indian Parliament, which kind of made uh, the the section, uh, which kind of made the separatist movement across India uh, illegal and punishable. So, so some kind of, for example, Dravida Munetra Kalakam in Tamil Nadu kind of transmuted its stand when it comes to separatism to to federalism in India, and it, it actually took forward uh, it ideologically. So, you know, there, which also in some way with the official language act mandating English to be the uh, official language of India, all these kind of transmuted the separatist tendencies into a stronger regional identity. Uh, so, meanwhile, we also see that the central government recently in its national education policy, uh, you know, promising to introduce regional education teaching of engineering courses in IITs, uh, you know, it's the central government, irrespective of who was in power, be it BJP or the Indian National Congress, have been traditionally, you know, uh, articulating Hindi only rhetoric, which was which was kind of very different uh, from what they did in the national education policy. So, you know, there is also this tendency of moving away from Hindi only thing, so Hindi only rhetoric. So, meanwhile, we also have the regional state governments emphasizing on English medium instruction. Uh, recently, Andhra Pradesh made uh, English as the only medium of instruction uh, in undergraduate courses. And Uttar Pradesh government, which is a BJP-led government also, it has actually closed down several Hindi medium schools and it converted several Hindi medium schools uh, into English ones. And it's very significant because, you know, like if you look at the ideologically, BJP is, is ideologically positioned itself as Hindutva. And one of the founding fathers of Hindutva ideology, Savarkar, in his essentials of Hindutva, argues that, you know, like Hindi language, he calls it Hindustani, which is this, which is the elder daughter of Sanskrit, uh, to be the official language of India. So it's, it's kind of interesting to note that BJP, which was traditionally and ideologically Hindutva, uh, drifting away from that to encompass English, uh, in English in education, which is quite fascinating. So now I come to the second premise based on these, that the regional identity in contemporary India is intact and it kind of, you know, suggests that the previous premise that this would actually uh, sustain an English language in India. So this it makes, you know, to arrive at the 
which is the question which I articulated in the beginning. So we know that English language is going to survive in India and it is going to flourish. And we also know that India is going to become uh, a superpower. So what will be the status of Indian languages? Having known that Indian governments in the past have technically tried decolonization by imposing Hindi, the Indian language, over English on Indians. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, so which is here, uh, we come to the notion of appropriation. So appropriation is the way you make a language, or I mean, you make the colonizers' practices as their own. Uh, for example, if you're talking about English language, the way you use English language is actually appropriation, which is you no longer, you know, try to position yourself within the within the uh, within the standards of speaking English language. So, for example, if you type the American uh, standardization, it is nothing but appropriation. So standardization is actually a part of appropriation. We also see debates surrounding uh, Australian English and New Zealand English, uh, but, but they are not yet standardized. And so, you know, they just exist as varieties, not standardized. So when it comes to Indian English, I mean, so there, the question is this, so should it, should, should appropriation uh, through standardization be, in, you know, be done to decolonize to de facto decolonize the language? Uh, the answer for that is no, because India is diverse. India is pluralistic, linguistically, culturally, traditionally, and standardizing language, uh, as we have seen from uh, from the from the Hindi model, for example, the Hindi language, which was supposed to become the only official language of India was uh, was highly Sanskritized and it was it was so the, the language that they wanted uh, Hindi to be is the Sanskritized one the standard Hindi is nothing but Sanskritized Hindi so it would be an imposition even among the Hindi speakers it would be an imposition of a, of a, of a standard not common to them as a standard across the nation. So, so you know, there, there would be inherent incompatibilities with it. So the same thing would also be done if you standardize Indian English. Sentence to Meanwhile, in North India, it was na, you know, you add na to the declarative sentence to kind of transmit it into an interrogative sentence. So we have such a diverse way of linguistic rendering of English language. So given these scenarios, the standardization of language, you know, it would not be encompassing everyone, every linguistic group or regions. Just like how USA excluded the African American immigrants and slaves in its standardization process. So, so that's the, I mean, like, once again, there will be inequalities, and once again, it would not be, it would not be the actual decolonization, because when you talk about, uh, when you talk about the colonial masters, they wanted to impose their standard on the other, on the, on the colonized, uh, so the, the, you know, they judge other people based on their standards, and when you impose uh, Indian English, I mean, when you standardize Indian English and impose it on the other Indians to whom that standard is not compatible, then it is nothing but new forms of colonization, right? For example, Suyan Anadurai, who was the ex-DMK uh, chief, argued in the parliament that this kind of imposition of Hindi language is nothing but linguistic imperialism. So this kind of imposition of standardized Indian English variety onto the onto every Indian would also seem like a linguistic imperialism. So have to overcome it. So, uh, so that the only thing is that the answer is uh, in the Delusian rhizome. It's like, you know, English language right now exists as a rhizome. It, for example, you have a Tamil version of English and a Tamil linguistic environment, just like how I gave an example, same with the Hindi speaking, uh, in, in the Hindi linguistic environment as well. The thing is, you know, you have to you have to acknowledge all these varieties. You have to acknowledge all these pluralistic rendering of English language, and it's like what uh, Kamala Das said in her introduction, uh, in her poem introduction. You know, the language that she speaks becomes hers. 
uh, irrespective of the standard that was, you know, imposed on her. So you you kind of personalize the language, the linguistic environments also personalize the language of the colonizer. And acknowledging that would actually be truly decolonial ideologically and practically, rather than imposing one standard uh, on the other, which once again is aligned with what the colonial master did in the past. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, Mr. Gohan, oh, I have you. a question for you, if I, if I may ask. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gohan, yeah, my yeah. question is, where do we bridge the gap, as you said, that we have different dialects, for example, the way a Telugu person speaks English, the way a Malayali speaks English is totally different. So the, the word standardization right. over there again, again becomes a very big question, where and how? So where do you think is the bridge or how do right. we bridge that gap between the way I speak English or my counterpart from Kerala or my counterpart from Canada speaks English? So where do you where do we bridge that gap? Or how do we bridge that gap to make it standardized? Right. I, I don't think I don't think it's necessary, you know, I don't think there is a necessity to bridge this gap as you know, like most of us are are able to understand what the other person speaks. For example, when you know, like when Lalu Prasad Yadav or Mamta Banerjee spoke in parliament, you know, they were they were in you know, a Lalu Prasad Yadav's English was mostly Hindi based. It, it was literally a Creole rendering and also same with Mamta Banerjee. It was nothing but the Bengali sized English, which is uh, nothing but a Creole. But but the but the point of the matter is like every one of us were able to understand. So there is no necessity for uh, you know standardization in this case because we are able to understand them. So and another another factor is that for example, if you, if you take England for example, um, the way the way the Cockney the Cockney English is completely different from our Northern Britain English. So even 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 that could be a problem in understanding them. There is also wide uh, difference in the way the vocabulary is used and also with pronunciation. So in that case, you know, the standardization, it's it's not it's not mutually intelligible at that point of time. So in that case, you know, the standardization is kind of necessary. But when it comes to India, uh, you you don't have this English as becoming not mutually intelligible. So I don't think standardization is right where you're able to understand what the other person speaks. So it's 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 mutually intelligible. So the one of the one of the one of the fundamental ideas of standardized standardization is to make the language mutually intelligible and to kind of also another one for the British is to kind of uh, you know kind of uh, make the language indifferent to one's class and the status. But it failed in the second part. But the first part is that the standardization is 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 primarily because to make the language mutually intelligible. Uh, in that case, you know, like we don't have linguistic environments that are intelligible. So the English based on these linguistic, for example, the English spoken in in uh, in Hindi in Hindi heartland could easily be understood by English spoken by 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 a person from Tamil Nadu. So it's not mutually in, unintelligible. So I don't think standardization is necessary. And once again, imposition of standardization uh, could is actually a, a new imperialistic uh, agenda. Uh, also, you know, like in the postmodern uh, world, we accept every every difference. Uh, we acknowledge every differences, and we kind of acknowledge every differences as truths, irrespective of believing in a universalist notion of what the world is. So, also ideologically speaking, you know, uh, I don't think standardization is not required. Thank you, Mr. Guhan. One more question, if I may ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we understand the fact that we are living in a world where there is a professional setup and it demands a particular language. For example, we have been following the British uh, English. And now, slowly, we are actually moving to what we call it as the American slang. Because most right. of the companies that we have are US based and we are slowly moving. Now, if uh, see, I was actually not talking about uh, standardizing our language. For example, right. if we are selected for an MNC, right. we have to unlearn and then again relearn. Right. So, how do you how do we understand the fact that the unlearning actually helps when there is a common standard language where we can actually understand, as you said, intelligibly we can understand and then relearn their language. 
So what is your stand on it? concerned uh, with the national perspective but but if you talk about the personal perspective since i talked about you know delusion rhizome uh, i don't think it should be a problem because my paper is mostly concerned with the national perspective and if a, if a, if a person chooses from for example uh, i'm a tamil so if i choose to unlearn the tamil rendering of english and if i had to choose the standard british variety, variety then i don't think it should be problematic uh, because, you know, it's, it's one's personal choice and, and, you know, like arguing against standardization is that it kind of resists one's personalized rendering of a language. Okay. Thank you, Guhan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the participants? I think in that case, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Guhan, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So next, we have uh, Sangeeta from Patterson College. Sangeeta, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you so much, sir. So good morning, everyone here. So I'll be presenting my paper on um, psychic complexity. So I have taken the text Oedipus Rex and I uh, have compared with the psychoanalytic theory. So I hope everything goes well. If my audio is not out of it, please let me know so that I can go with it. So is my presentation uh, visible? Yes, Sangeeta. Yes, yes, it is visible. Thank you, sir. So my topic here, uh, my theme is uh, Psyche Complexity. My title is Psyche Complexity, Bringing the Psychosexual Changes to the Oedipus Text, Oedipus Rex. So I'm Sangeeta, uh, doing my uh, MA English at Patrician College of Arts and Science, Prayar Chandra. So this is my uh, slide here. So first slide is about, uh, so this paper, I have taken the classic text and I have given the contemporary approach to this classic text. So this classic, uh, classic text, uh, Oedipus Rex, was written by uh, the famous writer, Sophocles. Uh, he was born on 496 BC and uh, he has written more than one, one, three plays, but only uh, seven were survived. And uh, he was uh, actually, uh, he was from an area which is outside uh, Athens, Greece. And uh, he was the first at a Dinosian and uh, he has been, he has won first at Dinosian in 18 times. And uh, his dramas has been uh, flourishing throughout uh, the Greek mythology. And uh, he was the innovator of drama and uh, he had painted the background scenery and three speaking actors. Even Aristotle has, uh, uh, appreciated uh, his play uh, Oedipus Rex and uh, he was quite interested in character portrait as we all know uh, the tragic hero Oedipus uh, he is the most uh, till now it is being uh, spoken even in this 21st century we are still speaking about his uh, characterization and um, he is also concerned with the individual struggle with fate uh, so that's what i have portrayed here and uh, oedipus uh, how oedipus has gone through what are the psychological changes what are the psychosexual changes he has gone through uh, or in this play and um, Moving on to the next one, that is the background. Uh, so what is this play about? Uh, we all know this is a play where uh, even uh, Freud has spoken about uh, the Oedipal complex, where uh, this uh, Oedipus is the tragic hero. He was the son of King Laius of Thebes and uh, also Queen uh, Jocasta. And in the end, the whatever the prophecies said uh, by this uh, in, in the Delphi mountain, has happened in this uh, thing and uh, when uh, Oedipus was born, uh, Laius uh, took Oedipus and uh, he gave uh, to the Polybus, uh, the king of Corinth and he was also a shepherd uh, and uh, he has been asked to throw away the baby as Oedipus will take, uh, kill his own father and uh, he will also uh, take, uh, he will also share the bed with his own mother and he will be the brother as well as the uh, father of his own daughters. 
and uh, that's what has happened so tragedy as well as the uh, role of fate has yeah, been emphasized in this play and uh, where oedipus grew up he also learned from the oracle that he will be destined to mate with his own mother and also he will uh, kill his own father so uh, leave, uh, he also didn't believe even king lies didn't believe that and uh, his son uh, oedipus also didn't believe that so this uh, when uh, lies uh, was when there was an argument between lies and uh, uh, oedipus uh, he killed uh, in the in the four cross roads and uh, that's what has happened and after that uh, this play is written in the postmodern perspective and uh, the play starts with an end, uh, sad note that um, the city was struck with some plague and uh, this a uh, whole people were um, dying out of the plague and oedipus was the one who has saved the city earlier uh, before becoming the king he, he was the one who saved the king uh, saved the uh, city from the uh, sphinx bird uh, by uh, spelling the uh, words and spelling the oh, those those uh, type of puzzles and now he is the reason uh, who, uh, by which the whole city has been stuck with the plague and so the psychoanalytic theory has been uh, brought out here so what is the psychoanalytic theory is that the behavior motivated by subconscious thoughts and feelings so what i'm going to say through this paper is that uh, these uh, changes what are these changes what are the psychosexual changes he has gone through in his childhood he didn't see his mother from his childhood and that has made him even uh, to uh, be with her as uh, to see her as his wife and also his daughters and uh, the unconscious mind and the repressed thoughts whatever is there uh, the the feelings and the conflicts which way were we will be going through the unconscious mind even everyone in this forum uh, whoever is listening to my lecture or uh, earlier papers whoever were listening to those things we might have gone through a lot of thoughts while we uh, were hearing so that is the repressed thoughts and the feelings which will be having so that will be uh, in the unconscious mind and uh, what are the uh, model of the mind so uh, conscious preconscious and unconscious so un conscious is something the perception thoughts and the emotions which exist according to our awareness so in this play we can see oedipus uh, doesn't know that tasta uh, is his mother and he marries her and becomes the king of uh, Thebes and also gives birth to uh, two daughters. But uh, when he gets to know that he was the uh, son as well as the husband for his own wife, uh, his own mother, so he was he was in the uh, that that emotional state that he went for killing his own mother. So Jocasta also killed herself. So these no, are the some of the psychosexual no, uh, changes which happens in everyone's mind. And uh, even I have taken two important uh, writers of psychoanalytic theory. So one is Jacques Lacan and another uh, is uh, Carl Jung. So Jacques Lacan, uh, who was a French thinker, and uh, he also he has used the linguistic mechanism in reading the human psyche. And he says that human conscious is not full of dark impulses, but it is the full discourse of others. So whatever others say, that also implies in our unconscious mind. So that is what Jacques Lacan has uh, implied in his. Uh, theories. So he says that three important. There are three important phases of the human mind. So what are those three important phases? Are imaginary, symbolic, and real. So here the imaginary uh, phase, where uh, the process of Oedipus complex takes place, and the child does not separate himself or herself from the body of the mother. So this phase is called as the child's self-identity outside the mother's body. And uh, the second phase is that symbolic phase. And uh, this is the mirror phase where the child has distinct and separate personality from the mother. So here language is something symbolic and which is actually literal and it is the center of Lacanian uh, psychoanalytic theory. And the third phase is this real phase where uh, he, the human mind talks about the 
com common consciousness. So he has talked about this common consciousness through this. And that is where I have taken, uh, so we can say that from the imaginary phase, uh, when a child is brought, brought up by the uh, parents, from there he gets attached to the mother and he, uh, he does not want to read, uh, like, uh, separate from the mother's body. And here, uh, in this case, when we take Oedipus, Rex, uh, Oedipus was, uh, after his birth, he was given to Polybus. So Polybus and his wife, Meryl, was not his real parents. And uh, he had that uh, connection with his mother, which made him go back uh, to his mother. And uh, the next one is um, the most famous uh, writer, Carl Gustav. So he was a Swiss psychiatrist, and he has theorized the stages of psychosexual development and he was the one who said about the collective unconscious so here collective unconscious meant it is the storehouse of latent uh, memories of our human and also pre-human ancestry so he was he said that archetypes and instinctual uh, images which plays an important role in the human psyche so um, in this Carl Jung's theory we uh, he or has concentrated on the second part of the human life. So the role of parents, according to him, the role of parents is very much important in the child's life where the mother is in charge of uh, adaptation and attachment and the father's role is to show the outer world and it, it, he always shows the rationality. So Oedipus was not able to get these two things from his parents because he was not there uh, in his childhood with them. And uh, Carl Jung has um, compared uh, the warrior period with that of uh, morning sun in his uh, theories and uh, according to him the child the children emerge from the collective unconscious and uh, he says that uh, the child he has discovered he has experimented that the child's difficulties could be found from the dreams of the parents so and uh, he also believed in dreams and fantasies with, within in his uh, childhood so here is the quote from this the dream is the small hidden door in the deepest and most intimate uh, sanctum of his soul, which opens to that primeval uh, cosmic light that was so long before there was conscious ego and will be so far beyond what a conscious ego could ever reach. So here, so he, he, as I said earlier, Carl Jung was always um, had the belief on the, uh, the dream and con uh, dream and fantasies which made him write this. And I took the reference of uh, Carl Jung through the book, The Stages of life and um, that's all with my presentation i think i have you here with my presentation if there is any questions please let me know I will, uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, opportunity thank you uh, Oh, uh, actually, I have an observation. Yes, so yes sir. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, so I have a small observation and it's not a question. Uh, regarding the Jacques Lacan part, you actually said that, you know, the outside or the other kind of, you know, kind of uh, suggests the unconscious. Uh, but it's actually, you know, like you actually have an unconscious working and I mean, you, you actually have the desire working and when you get to know about the linguistic boundaries, for example, when you get, for example, let me give you an example. The child might have a, might fantasy its mother, his or her mother, right? So when the child is introduced to the linguistic environment, he gets to know that symbol of mother and he also gets to know from the outside that he or she should not fantasize his mother right yes and it kind of becomes yes, so. unconscious right so i think i think there was some 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 clarity was missing on that part and that i have and I, of course you can actually you know like interpret this whole concept um in uh, in the in the uh, Whole, you can use employ the whole concept in interpreting the deepest Rex, which you had done, uh, which is extremely good. But I think there was this clarity missing in this part of your theory. Yeah, I think you could rearticulate it. Well, that's the only observation I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll work on it. Any other questions, forum?
So if there are no questions, we'll move on to the next presentation. Next we have uh, from SIT College. Madam, please take over. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the title of my paper is The Reader in Sashi Desh Pandey's uh, The Narayanpur Incident. Now, uh, when we analyze a literary text, we have always focused on either the author or text or the reader. So we have had author-oriented approaches. With the advent of new criticism, it focused on the text. And uh, we had text-oriented approaches. and uh, with the introduction of reader response critics, the focus from the text shifted to the reader. Now, this paper will analyze Shashi Desh Pandey's Narayanpur incident from a reader response perspective. Now, the setting of the novel uh, is uh, in uh, Sanur and Narayanpur village. It happens around uh, the Quit India moment. Uh, the novel begins uh, with a resolution that gets passed. Uh, sorry for the date over there. Uh, okay, the novel begins. At on 8 August 1942, with the arrest of uh, Gandhi, there are lots of consequences which happen, and there are hurtles and protests which happen in a non-violent non manner in the village in Sanur. Now, the characters in this novel are Jagannath Rao, Sonu, Annapara, Mohan, Suman, Arvind, Sadanand, Babu, Manju, and Vasant. The reason why I have list, uh, written the list of characters is usually in any novel, when we analyze, we basically focus on the protagonist and the uh, like, you know, we uh, analyze it, uh, how the how the protagonist uh, faces his life or her life. Now, over here, this being a novel which focuses on the Indian independence and from a reader response perspective, it becomes mandatory to analyze every character and how they contribute to the understanding of the text and also to the understanding of what happens uh, during the Quit India movement. Now, uh, the very title, uh, the Narayanpur incident, actually, as a reader, I was like wondering, uh, I mean, like, you know, where is this place called Narayanpur and what happens? Because the title says uh, in the Narayan Narayanpur incident. Now, the author has uh, drafted the novel in such a manner that the story begins actually in Sanur. The first six chapters focus on uh, the incidents that happen in Sanur, and then the last six chapters focus on Narayanpur. Now, the timeline is 18th or 8th August 1942, and the resolution of AACC, which is passed, is the opening part of the novel, where we have the arrest of Gandhi and uh, uh, the protagonist, Jagannath Rao, who is a school teacher, and other prominent men of Sanur also gets arrested because they protest in a nonviolent manner to release Gandhi. Now, after the Jagannath Rao gets arrested, we have Sonu and her children who face hardships. So since they are unable to kind of, uh, uh, I mean, stay in Sanur, they have to shift to Narayanpur, and that's where various incidents happen. That's why the author has titled the novel as Narayanpur Incident. There is burning of railway station, police station, and the raid in the treasury. And uh, there's a particular incident where the children try to kind of wear a Gandhi cap uh, to the policemen, and there is a physical battle that happens to a lot of, which leads to a lot of protests and deaths. And uh, there's, there's a lot of rigorous struggle which is shown and how finally, like, you know, uh, the, uh, the Indian uh, uh, win their battle of independence. That's the brief summary of the novel. Now, to analyze it from the reader response perspective, there are various reader response critics. I'm focusing on uh, Wolfgang Iser, who's a very prominent reader response critic, who focuses on... Uh, uh, I mean, reading as a uh, as a very passive, uh, I mean, as an active uh, process. So meaning is not contained in the text, but generated in the reading process. He also emphasizes the fact that reading activity uh, through, I mean, like through the uh, through which our meaning is constructed is actually pre-structured in the text. Now, in a reader response analysis, reader plays a prominent role in the interaction between the text and the reader, and especially when an author writes. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, a literary work, the authors leave certain blanks or indeterminacies for the reader to fill in. Okay, so in the reading process, it is a reader who tries to kind of, you know, fill in the uh, blank which is left by the author. 
So when we read a text, the reader is on a journey where there are lots of expectations and assumptions, and these expectations are modified as the memories are transformed as we pass through the text, and there are ch there's change in viewpoints. So according to ISA, reading is not passive, where uh, the reader has to fill in the blanks or the gaps to understand uh, the text in a better manner. There are two concepts, blanks and negations, which play a pivotal role in understanding this particular text. Now, uh, now, what does a reader do when, when a reader reads this particular text? Now, now, though the reader is informed about the quit in their moment, the reader would like to know what happens in Narayanpu. And then uh, the freedom struggle. How is, uh, I mean, like, you know, the, the contribution done by the men or the women or the children? And uh, with men being arrested, how will the women and youngsters contribute to the freedom struggle? And uh, in the epilogue, we get to see uh, how uh, India gets its independence. Now, uh, now, when I read the text, okay, the very beginning part of the text, the introductory part of the text itself says, there's a direct address to the reader in the introduction which says, I quote, let me assure you that most of the incidents you will read of it in this book did in fact happen, unquote. So now the author makes it very clear to the reader that this book was an inspiration from a real life incident that happened in India during the Quit India movement. So we, uh, I mean, it is very, very, very evident, right, right in the introductory chapter itself, that reader is given prominence. Now, as the novel unfolds, we have the novel happening in Salur, and uh, it is through the various characters, like through uh, Sonu, the protagonist's wife, and her children, Babu and Manju. I mean, like, you know, it's these characters who play a key role in helping the reader to understand and unravel the gaps and blanks in the text in the process of reading. See, there are various uh, instances where, like, you know, when there's this resolution passed about the Quit India movement, we have this young boy, like, you know, who tries to understand and, I mean, like, you know, who tries to give us, give the reader the various uh, hints as to what happens with the consequence of Gandhi's arrest. The children in the novel play a prominent role because uh, it is uh, their impressions which kind of, you know, helps the reader to understand the text better. So. We have Babu who tries to say that the Hartals happen because they hope that the release of Gandhi will happen and the Britishers will yield uh, to the requests made by the, uh, by the uh, Indian people. So there are, there are various queries raised in the minds of the reader. How will uh, the young uh, India or uh, the people of India fight and uh, chase the Britishers away? So the reader through the conversation of the characters gets to understand that Gandhi was an influencer. Even a non-Indian reader will get a hint about the role played by Gandhi in the freedom struggle. Now, uh, after the arrest of Mohan's father, who the protagonist, uh, the reader is made to wonder as to how, uh, how uh, the young boy and the uh, others will uh, take part in the freedom struggle. Mohan plays a prominent role in the protests, uh, though police detain him and uh, Sonu, the protagonist's uh, wife, is questioned. She manages the situation by shifting to Narayanpur and stays in Anapa's house. There are various incidents that happen. And initially, like, when they move to Narayanpur, there's not much of uh, uh, happenings as to the freedom struggle. But by and by, the reader gets to understand that even in Narayanpur, there are, uh, I mean, like, you know, people who work towards the freedom struggle. And uh, uh, I mean, like, you know, there are many people who do things for the sake of the country, but it is all done in a very, very uh, reticent manner, like, you know, that uh, they don't want to get into the trouble of the police. But in, in the meantime, they also, like, you know, contribute to the creation of awareness of the freedom struggle. So when we analyze the novel, uh, we get to see there are consequences like burning of railway stations, police station, police bangla, and the raid in the treasury. All these kind of show how people, I mean, even uneducated old men and children, you know, contribute to the uh, freedom struggle. Finally, in the epilogue, in the epilogue, we get to see how the independence is gained and. Uh, the response given by the reader as the text progresses helps in connecting the various segments into a whole, like the arrest of Jagannath Rao, the active participation of the youngsters, the ordeals faced by the women, and the hardships faced by the Britishers. All this is like, you know, uh, I mean, being connected, or, or uh, the implied reader tries to kind of create an interaction between the text and the reader in the reading process. Thus, the reader plays a prominent role in uh, filling the blanks which is left in the narrative by uh, using the concepts of wandering viewpoint, uh, blanks, and negations.
Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful presentation. Any questions? Uh, ma'am, I have a question. Can I ask? You? Yes, yes, sir. And the question is that we all have these personal ideologies or uh, bias. So how do you think that this kind of personal ideologies or bias hamper the way we read a text or the way we understand a text? All right. Uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, when we do an analysis, obviously, I uh, I might have a personal liking and there might be prejudices, but I think we need to do an objective reading of the text. And uh, that actually will uh, enable, uh, I mean, like, you know, to do a, a proper analysis of the text. Normally, like when we read texts, uh, we have to set aside our subjective uh, likes and dislikes. And uh, I think uh, that will enable us to do proper justice uh, in analyzing text better. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma yes, 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 sir. Uh, it was wonderful presentation. It was a wonderful presentation, ma'am. Uh, I would like to just quickly clarify, ma'am. Like, uh, yes. uh, not just by just uh, 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 my suggestion and uh, uh, my overview on your presentation, ma'am. Like, um, uh, say for example, a new reader, maybe uh, say for example, a UG student or a PG student uh, who has just initiated the, um, uh, the reading skill and started reading as literature students, we are supposed to read a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, we have various theories, various concepts uh, uh, in literature, in understanding yeah. a novel. But, uh, say mm -hmm. for example, uh, if, if reading a text from a feministic point of view, we have uh, various theories associated with it, like Marxist feminism, we have radical feminism. Uh, uh, what is your suggestion, ma'am? You need to strengthen the concepts first and then start reading, or after reading, we are supposed to find out uh, uh, these concepts and uh, uh, strengthen those concepts. Uh, just a suggestion to the students, ma'am. All right. Uh, when it comes to theories, uh, I mean, if it's going to be a literary student who's going to uh, analyze a text, it will be always, I mean, if you want to apply a theory, it is always better to know what the theory is all about. If it's going to be a feminist theory, it is always better to know the concept, the definition, uh, whichever, I mean, like, you know, uh, theorist which you want to apply, it is better to know them and then, like, read the novel. And then, like, you know, uh, as you read the novel, you will be able to apply it. I would suggest, I mean, like, you know, it is not that uh, when we read a text, the very first reading, we cannot apply the concepts. It takes a lot of time. The first reading will be just uh, a general reading where you kind of get to know the over, uh, overall plot and the subplot of the work. But when you have to do, a, uh, I mean, research uh, work and when you want to kind of do it, uh, it will be better that you know the concept of the theory better beforehand and then you go and apply it to the particular text which you're working. So you need to be very thorough with the uh, theory first and only then you can apply it to the text. Fine, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from the forum? Good morning. Sir, can I proceed? Uh, yes, ma'am. Just a minute, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Are you presenting the screen for me, sir? Ma'am, just a minute. Just, just a minute. Uh, thank you, Fatima, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. Um, have you thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, have you sent the PPT to us? Yes, sir. Otherwise, I will share. Shall I share my screen? I have sent the PPT already, sir. Matangi. Sure, ma'am. You can, you can proceed in sharing the screen, ma'am. Please. Oh, you're not presenting it? No, if you want me to present, I'll do it, ma'am. No problem. I'll do it myself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Uh, am I audible and visible, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good morning and respects to the chair, to the college which has given me this opportunity to present my ideas under the given topic, Transverse, transversality of desires, identity, sexuality, and race in time and space, a curing study of Andrea Ackerman's Call Me By Your Name. And I am Matangi, Assistant Professor, English Department, AM Jain College, Meenambakam. My, my research is based on cure studies, so I'm interested in presenting papers focusing on the same. And I've taken one of the most popular novels of the time and also a movie version of it, which was popular. So I have dealt with a novel version of it here. This uh, particular novel, Call Me By Your Name by Andrew Ackerman, it, it, is, it deals with identity and sexual politics. And... This novel can be interpreted on an intersectional plane because it involves so many other intersectional factors besides talking about or besides being merely dubbed as a gay fiction or, a, you know, a queer fiction. It is something beyond all that. And, and this aspect of something beyond is what I want to or I am trying to or I have tried to focus in my paper. And um, it is a saga of curing desires. And the main objective of my study is, again, a curing study of this novel, that is to interpret the novel uh, from a cure perspective and also dealing with the themes of acceptance and realization, acceptance of the sexuality and uh, realization of the fact that this is the sexuality which is in me, which is inherent in me. And uh, this paper also traces the transnational aspect or the travels associated with the cureness in the characters or how does travel how does geography affect cureness if it does at all the influence of geography on cureness uh, when when i say geography travel again themes of love themes of separation and themes of resignation comes travels it can it has both the sides you know like we can get to know people at the same time we can get separated from the ones we already know yes and the influence of passing years of time cutting across spatial geographies on curing sexuality is the pivot of the study how does travel geography influence transnational travel or any kind of travel influence curing sexuality that is the main focus of my study the study aims at exploring parallel currents of space and time in cure lives yes how cure lives cure individuals how the cures are affected by space and time, on space and time and beyond space and time. That is my study in this paper. So the very novel talks about instant affinities. You know, instant affinity, affinities is a term used by the characters in the novel, uh, which says there are two characters, Elio and Oliver. They get attracted instantly the moment they come together. And uh, there are two identities. One, because they realize that they are getting attracted to each other and there is something cure about it. Another, because they realize that both these men, both these boys, they realize that uh, what stuck them was, what brought them together was the Jewish identity, the identity of ethnicity, race and religion. And uh, the Star of David, that is the cure race, meaning how does race influence uh, cureness? So this is also another aspect which... I have mentioned in the title and which I have focused on the paper. And uh, as we all know, both these characters, Elio, both these boys, Elio and Oliver, in the beginning of the novel, they were boys. Then they grow up to men. So these young boys, Elio and adolescent boys, Elio and Oliver, they get attracted towards each other. And uh, it's also what brought them together was their Jewish identity. And Oliver comes from America for a uh, research program under Elio's father's guidance in Italy. So this travel from America to Italy, and uh, there is this transnational travel across the bond boundaries of space of one's own space. And when Oliver travels, Elio meets him, 
and they get attracted in that italian villa of elio and his father so all these are academics elio's father happens to be an academic and oliver also comes for his post doctoral work under elio's father and um, with reference to this uh, identity of being jews you know both of them elio's mother always says they are jews of discretion now this discretion is one quality associated with the jewish race from the time of the old testament and um, in fact this novel has got strong autobiographical element because the novelist akiman himself has written a memoir out of the egypt in which he talks so much about the fact that his family has come out of egypt only because of the anti semitist meaning anti jew uh, urges there anti semitist surge there rise of anti semitist violence and uh, that is what he mentions so there is this strong jewish identity and this jewish identity of the novelist himself is evident through these characters you know both elio and oliver oliver sports the star of david which is again an insignia of the jewish uh, you know practices and this star of david attracts elio because he feels that oliver is so open about his jewishness which not many people are you know and uh, when they both understand that they have desires for each other you know uh, elio states that i love the egalitarianism of the moment i love feeling younger and older human to human man to man jew to jew so the love shared between elio and oliver more than being queer more than being gay it is this what one of the binding factors is their jewish identity and oliver's open declaration of it and uh, elio also follows oliver's suit by sporting star of david necklace later okay in his life now the cocardium the nature of desire cocardium is a latin phrase of phrase for hearts for hearts and in this novel this particular word is used you know now i have spoken about desire in the title of the novel desire what kind of desire desire parallel to the travels by these two characters inward desire outward desire inward travel travel into the realization of their sexuality outward journeys going to places in italy or going out of italy later you know in life so both are parallel currents there is this constant journeying in the novel sexually psychologically and also geographically okay so that is uh, and when they travel traveling give, gives space for fulfillment of their own desires okay because you will find that one particular local is queer friendly another particular local is not queer friendly so travel geography and space lot of influence you can see it one can see it on the desires of the individual now it is a conglomeration of race during sexuality and travels beyond the frontiers of geography so this would be the theme of my paper now cocardium or hearts of hearts elio and oliver elio and oliver first openly express their desire for each other in a place called mons berm in italy where they go it is actually a an artist place and um, this uh, trip inside italy you know they are already staying in italy they the trip inside italy it uh, kind of increases their intimacy geography or space or travel is actually influencing the desire the sexuality and timelessness and eternal nature of the relationship which elio and oliver are going to have in their lives ahead is actually manifested in this particular scene in a place called mons berm mons berm where uh elio actually recollects the uh, you know uh, happening of percy shelley uh, shelley's heart kept by his wife uh, you know mary shelley and the kind of obsession shared by elio for oliver initially elio has strong feelings then he understands oliver also has the same feelings so this particular scene when they meet when they go together at a place called mons berm in italy that is a scene which it's kind of transcendental nature of love that uh, goes on between elio and oliver now uh, next is uh, the catacombs of human desire the last bout now as this intimacy grows between elio and oliver they kind of come together they kind of physically consummate the relationship and even after consummation the question is what is the strategy of this relationship what is the future path how can this relationship be taken ahead in life which is again a big question in all queer lives so um, they have a chance before oliver could finish his course he is actually recruited for 6 months as a scholar under elio's father now when the time for his course 
conclusion comes you know he both of them spent uh, some time out in italy around italy rome and uh, that would be the last phase of their physical love because they are not going to get their time again in their lives for this expression and italy offers a mixed experience that is why i said catacombs a mixed variety of religion you can find there religious architecture you can find in italy and the mixed variety of emotions and experiences which elio shared for each other uh, oliver shared for each other and uh, another aspect of desire is a desire to transform into the object of love itself elio wants to become like oliver to be him like the next stages of love after you have attained physical after one has attained physical consummation now what is the next stage self identification like kind of elio wants to become oliver elio loves him and the desire to become the object of love itself is so dominant in case of uh, elio now this is the next level of love that radiates between elio and oliver and italy rome and all the history associated with rome you know the art the architecture the flourishing uh, you know rome it kind of provides a suitable ambience for elio and oliver to be open about their proclamations about their love and then another thing is the site of san clement a place there elevates the nature of shared love between elio and oliver on a very divine plane on a very sanctified i will use the word divine sanctified plane you know it's like they feel their love is eternal their love is superior there are no qualms about it no longer should they feel shy that they are queer they are gay no it it's it's gone beyond all those margins and this is where one can deduce the fact that there is certainly interdependence of geography and queer sexuality geography does influence curing behavior and next is we saw cure race now it's cure space cure space is usually a term or a theoretical term which was which is used in transgender studies uh, cure space is usually closet it's a metaphor it's a metaphorical term and usually closet is a metaphor for this understanding cure space and when i say coming out of the closet it means cure liberation which happened in america so when in the gay and lesbian movements in america uh, people used to sport uh, you know t-shirts and hold uh, placards portraying um, bearing the slogans like come out of the closet coming out of the closet is being explicit about one's own queerness about one's own sexuality now this rome that plays in rome you know which we saw in the earlier slide it offers a kind of cure space in which desires of elio and oliver bloom and which is the first cure space here mons burn that is where they start to express and then it becomes kind of physically togetherness then in italy it rome it goes to the next level of being transcendental yes and traditional space is in cure theory especially with reference to transgenders and even in gay and lesbian movements traditional spaces at home have been associated with heterosexuality and breaking these confinements is a realization of cureness even home the the very construction of home which is with its traditional associations in european homes for example the dining room is associated with men the drawing room is associated with men the uh, you know the kitchen is associated with women the library is associated with men so all these kinds of traditional associations you know locked associations cureness wants to break open all this confines of a traditional home anything against the normativity that is cureness so in transgender movement the word plumbing is been the key term to accept the bodies as being they are so uh, in uh, for example giving uh, in in transgender movements when we talk about giving separate washrooms for the transgenders giving separate cure spaces in how in homes in work spots and in the society the word plumbing is used plumbing is a kind of cleansing it's like look at me not as a woman not as a man or not as anything but as a body a body that exists a human body that exists with all its feelings and emotions ghost spots curing memories in simon space ghost spots is actually a title from the novel itself which i took now the next aspect of this cure behavior is how time and space is going to recapitulate the togetherness in in terms of memory see life the very process of life is acquisition of memories now here the entire fictional narrative is a travel in and out of memories in time place and sexuality now the histrionics of desire it is it is interlaced is coated with all the above factors i mentioned here in the title and also in this in the slides on the slides now elio's italian villa where oliver comes to stay for his course for 6 months you know 
that is evocative because strong evocative memories of that place is there for Elio and Oliver. And then they have this experience at Mons Burn. They have material possessions, memories in the form of material things like they have a picture of Mons Burn. Then uh, Oliver, Oliver's blue shirt is preserved by Elio for years and years. These are all material gifts or things which should be evocative of memories beyond time and space. Yes, insignia of shared memories, emblem of shared memories. Now, um, the next thing is the narrative depicts the lives of Elio and Oliver. When uh, Oliver has the narrative, then the fictional narrative goes on, you know, where Oliver gets married. He has his own family, he has two, two sons, but however, and his life in America, Elio also grows up. But however, love between them you know the pure sexuality that they had the pure love that they had is always the same has always been the same across cutting across the limits of time space you know everything geography now acumen through this novel beyond all this technical and theoretical aspects calls for a universal understanding of love in any form there is no normativity love needs no rules it is only mere blending of identities and that is why the title of this novel, Call Me By Your Name, Elio tells Oliver, you call me by your name and I will call you by the same. Meaning, thorough identification of or interchange of personalities. That is what happens here. Thereby denoting the blurring of bodily distinctions while embracing pureness. See, you and I are not separate bodies. You are one. We both are one. That is a kind of union, transcendental union that happens in case of Elio and Oliver. The culmination and the continuum, call me by your name. So it's a continuum. This kind of love is a continuum as far as this novel is concerned Before between Elio and Oliver. Mm -hmm. Time makes a sentimental. Perhaps in the end it is because of time that we suffer. These are the words from the novel. Life is a recapitulation of lived memories. The novel is a memoir of love and life. It's an iconic representation of moments shared by Elio and Oliver through converging and diverging, converging cureness and diverging separations in life, physical separations. We travel with Elio and Oliver in the novel and the movie version of it out of terrestrial spaces. You know, this love kind of, it's a travel in the novel, through the novel, out of spaces. We jump spaces, photograph every kind or every twist with the hope to revisit the same. We leave, we leave one place and move to the next place with the hope that again we will revisit it but ironically we may never revert to the loving quarters of life yes school days we love but we have come so far away from that we photograph with the hope that one day we may go back to school and visit the school which may not happen for everyone so the same thing happens in case of Olio and Eliva or, or Elio and Oliver see even while talking I have interchanged the names that is the power of love that is you know carried uh, on in this novel that is representation represented in this novel yes so the novel emotes us to human experience rather than being a gay fiction or a pure fictional narrator so let's no longer confine it to the terms of being a gay fiction or a pure fictional narrator it is a universal understanding of human experience but through two two through uh, two representative characters elio and oliver thank you ma'am thank you uh for listening to me patiently. So, any questions from the forum? Sir, can you be louder? Any questions from the forum? Uh, sir, um, I just have a comment. Um, Ma'am, it was a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you, uh, Gohan, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really, really wonderful. Uh, I have actually, you know, like attended, uh, I mean, I have actually attended several presentations on call. Hello. Hello. Guhan, sir. Audio connectivity is gone. Yes, ma'am. I think his audio is not. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah, now, okay, sir. You're back. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I have actually attended several uh, presentations on Call Me By Your Name and uh, yours, uh, I would say, is one of the best. Uh, thank you I'm very much. I'm humbled and much. thank you so much, uh, Gohan, sir, for your appreciation. Prithviraj, sir, and Dharmendra, sir, any other questions or shall I? No, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful thank presentation. So thank you, sir. Last presentation.
Thank you. Now, Miss Sunita Paul, to take over the stage. Sir? We'll move on to the next presentation, ma'am. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So I call upon Miss Neetu Paul to take over the session. Ms. Nithupal from GLA University, Matra. Yes, sir. You can start your presentation. Am I audible, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nithupal, research scholar from GLA University, Mathura. And uh, my topic of presentation is Challenges and problems in English language teaching practices in Bihar. We see that there are many challenges to effective teaching and learning in Bihar, including significant shortage of teachers and a need for at least 14,000 new schools. This is according to the report of 2015. Uh, we see that aspects of English in Bihar have been very under-researched, such as an analysis of typical class size in Bihar, identification of teacher language proficiency, current teaching practice, and the impact of training on this practice and the access to and availability and use of information technology at secondary level in the state. English language has played a vital role in all the stages of India's freedom movement, formation, and evolution into a nation of unique identity. English has been the language of diplomacy, administration, education, and judiciary and information technology. Its role is further widening day by day in the global and digital era. But still, we see that there are many states where development of English language teaching practices are very slow. The problems of teaching English in India, especially in Bihar, are due to policy makers, police and poverty and population. The identified problems like clear-cut policy, deficiency exposure, non-availability of suitable material, lack of qualified teachers, improper methodology, lack of motivation, teacher-student ratio, and faulty examination system and system need attention to rectify the problems in teaching and learning of English in Bihar. Teaching English language in a multilingual context is an enormous challenge for the English teachers due to linguistic diversity in the classrooms. The students in the multilingual classrooms lack confidence to use English language because they hesitate to commit mistakes. The curriculum we see, uh, especially in the states like Bihar, the curriculum may be inappropriate for the students to improve their English learning. Often code switching is used by the teachers to instruct students uh, just one minute. And so the problems of teaching English, we can see that it's in country like India, especially in Bihar, classes of mixed ability groups are a feature of every small town or village. In most of the rural parts of India, learning teaching process is done in the vernacular language. On the other hand, most of the competitive examinations, higher education and employment require English as medium of instruction. The ratio of students to teachers is high, leading to ineffectiveness. The rural atmosphere doesn't provide students the opportunity to speak and learn English. The size of the classes everywhere is considerably very large. This is one of the reasons why individual attention is not possible to the students. Teaching of English needs a drastic change for the benefit of learners in schools and colleges. The students of rural and semi-urban areas in India face a lot of problems as English is not their mother tongue. English is the second language. In many places, English becomes the third language as they have a local language. As compared to the learners from urban areas, learners from rural areas face more difficulties during the process of language acquisition. In urban areas, parents are mostly educated. So the domestic environment helps the students from urban areas acquire the language quickly. Students do not get chance to speak or read in English in the rural parts of the country. In villages and small towns, students mainly hail from rural areas. 
Bilingual method is adopted in language classes. This method helps only to slow learners to some extent. <coughs> Moreover, this act reduces the real learning process as a whole. If a student doesn't understand in English, he or she asks for an explanation in, uh, in his or her mother tongue. Consequently, the English teacher is in a st state to adopt bilingual method. Lack of trained teachers in rural areas has become a reality. Teaching is a continuous process and teachers in rural India are often debarred from attending workshops and seminars to acquaint themselves with new ways and methods. The rural population of India, usually which we see, they depend on agriculture and limited income, end up sending their children to government schools where English is not taught as a skill but as a subject. Throughout India, there is a belief among almost all castes and classes in both rural and urban areas in the transformative in the transformative power of English. English is seen not just as a useful skill, but as a symbol of better life, a pathway out of poverty and oppression. Grammar translation method is used by the teacher to teach young children, where the teacher explains every word to students in the native languages which they are able to understand to make them understand and learn English. However, this method faces a major disadvantage. Both the teacher and the student concentrate more on language one rather than language two. In this method, English language class seems to be language one rather than language two class. Students get only limited benefit through this approach. Unfortunately, there is still in use in many rural schools throughout India. So, According to my view, the teacher should be trained to cope with the challenges they face in multilingual classrooms as well as rural area classrooms. So challenges and the problems of teaching English language in Bihar could be improved by following some ways. So here uh, I have uh, mentioned some ways by which the challenges and the problems faced by the teacher in English language teaching in Bihar could be improved. So first point is, uh, we can find different ways to teach the students a new lesson or concept. Uh, we should be approachable. Third point is, uh, we can make learning fun by which students, uh, they can participate more, they can interact more with the teachers and they can uh, put their questions in the classrooms. Because mostly we see that the students hesitate in asking questions to the teachers in English. And the fourth point is prepare in advance for the class. The teacher should prepare for advance in the class. Uh, fifth is encourage verbal practice. The students should be encouraged to speak whatever they speak, either right or wrong. They should be encouraged to speak in the class. Sixth point is put technology to good use. And my last point is be understandable and forgiving. Sometimes we see that uh, teachers in the class, they just go on speaking and they just go on teaching everything, but the students does not get what uh, they are taught. So the teacher should be understandable and forgiving if any mistakes are done in the class. Students should be encouraged. So this much from my side. With this, I thank you everyone for listening me. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, uh, Neetha ma'am. Uh, any questions from the participant side? Have any questions? Uh, Neetha ma'am, uh, it was good. The presentation was good. Yes. Uh, uh, I would just like to ask one question, ma'am. Like, how do you uh, yeah. maintain the balance between uh, the advanced learner and a slow learner in an English class, ma'am? So how do you uh, maintain a balance? Uh, what what sort uh, of uh, uh, techniques that you follow yeah, yeah. in an English class, especially when you have uh, uh, yeah. the end, the two end, two end of students? Yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. When uh, this type of situation comes, I just uh, encourage the slow learners, and I just give them chance to interact with the uh, the fast learners who uh, speak good English. So when they just interact uh, in a friendly manner then they feel better and they understand the things uh, very nicely and clearly. Yes, sir. 
Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions from the participant side? Okay, I consider that uh, we have come to the uh, end of the uh, uh, presentation. So that's it from the uh, virtual uh, room number two. Uh, we will be uh, resuming. We will be starting our valedictorian session in the same inauguration link that we have joined in the morning session. Uh, thank you so much. It was a wonderful uh, morning session that we had. Um, so we had a lot of interaction, a lot of wonderful things to learn uh, from the participants. And thank you so much once again on behalf of the PG Department of English. I thank each and every uh, paper presenter over here and the participants uh, for their active participation. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. So uh, we kindly request you all join back in the uh, inauguration link, the same link uh, um, uh, that uh, we joined in the morning session uh, for the valedictorian session. So uh, I think uh, uh, the principal and the other uh, uh, members have already joined. So I request everyone to join uh, the inauguration. Thank you so much.